May only God's word be spoken. May only God's word be heard. I went to Israel last May with the pilgrimage from Christ Church. Of course, I expected to experience many emotions in the Holy Land that I had read about my whole life. One friend prepared me to be taken by surprise at unexpected moments. She called these goosebump moments. I had one such experience in a town called Birkin. I was e eager to visit this town, the name of which reminds me of my maiden name, Borquin. I wanted to see this place. You could also say I was hopeful I would have a numinous experience. But I can assure you, I can't make these feelings happen. When they come upon me, they simply come. They take my breath away. And this is what happened in Birkin. There is a Byzantine-era Orthodox church in this town, considered to be the third oldest church in the world. It's a remarkable place, built on the location of the story we just heard in Luke's Gospel. The present church incorporates an ancient cave that contains a small opening in the ceiling. It is believed that Jesus healed the lepers in this cave, and that it is through the hole in the ceiling that people may have dropped food and water to the lepers quarantined there. It was standing in this cave that I had this overwhelming feeling of connection with Jesus. Here he was. Here was the spot that the Bible became no longer a story of ancient people, but one of fact. To stand in that cave and know that the lepers had been here and to look up through the opening in that ceiling and know of Jesus' power did take my breath away. It was dreamlike. In Luke's Gospel, there is a discrepancy about the region between Samaria and Galilee. Actually, these places border each other, so there is no actual region between. Was Luke fuzzy on his geography? Or was he speaking theologically? Does this encounter happen in a space that's set apart as far as Luke is concerned? On the surface, the treatment of the ten lepers is routine. They would have been quarantined because of their highly contagious skin disease. Their plea for help is understandable. The encounter between Jesus and the ten is unremarkable and remarkable. Jesus, upon hearing the pleas, calmly tells them to go to their priest. He doesn't make a big scene of healing them. We simply hear him tell them to go to their priest, which, by the way, they would have had to do to be certified free to return to their families. The ten go running off. Suddenly, one notices that he is healed, and he turns back to offer his thanksgiving dramatically. Luke makes a point of the fact that this man was a Samaritan. Jesus calls him a foreigner. Today, I call him other, a title that's important. Either way, he makes a scene of his gratitude. It's not lost on Jesus that only the one man returns. Jesus tells this one man, showing gratitude, that his faith has made him well. We hear this about many of the miracles Jesus does, but there is more to the story than the healing. All of these details point us to the teaching of Christ's followers, then and now, 
that faith is not a matter of believing only, but also of seeing. All the lepers were healed. One, however, saw, noticed, and responded. This action made the difference. Because he sees what has happened, the leper recognizes God's power. Because he sees what has happened, the leper is moved to gratitude. Because he sees what has happened, the leper changes his direction. He returns to Jesus. In this light, this passage is an invitation to recognize that what we see makes all the difference. In the face of adversity, do we see danger or opportunity? In the face of human need, do we see demand or gift? In the face of the other, do we see a threat or a friend? And furthermore, when we look to God, do we see stern judge or a loving parent? When we look to ourselves, do we see favor or a beloved child of God? When we look to the future, do we see fearful uncertainty or an open horizon? There is, of course, no right answer to any of these questions. How we answer depends upon what we see. Yet, how we answer dramatically shapes both our outlook and our action. When we hear news reports, do we see what has happened? For example, I'm thinking of Hurricane Matthew's destructive attack in Haiti. Over 800, I, the reports keep climbing, but over 800 people are dead. That's what we're knowing. That's what we're seeing. When we really see, we are stirred to action. Out of gratitude, out of gratitude for what we have, we reach out and return to Jesus, like the leper in the story. Perhaps this is a key to stewardship. Good stewardship is not First, about giving, but about seeing all that we have been given and rejoicing in a way that cannot help but shape how we act. Perhaps this is even a key to Christian life. Before we are called to believe or confess or help or do, we are called simply to see and to help others do the same. We are called, that is, to point out our blessing, to claim God's mercy, to name grace wherever we are and with all the courage we can gather. At the beginning of this story, 10 men are pleading for help. By the end of the story, all 10 are healed. But one of them has more. He is not just healed. He is made whole in relationship with God. He gives deep, meaningful thanks. He can see.